that puts a lot of pressure on you guys. Every one of you has to speak up, okay? What's that? Yeah, well, that's fine. We can fill time by repeating questions. That's okay. All right, welcome. We'll get started. Um, Butch's class so far on finances has, to say the least, been, uh, been a challenge for, for me personally, looking at uh, how I give and looking at how I view finances. And he's definitely, um, I think this class has been good. It's been eye-opening and probably has for you guys as well. But um, when he uh, asked me to teach for him today and the subject was on tithing, I was like, thanks a lot, appreciate that. <laughs> um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna tackle this topic. We're not gonna, I shouldn't say tackle it. We're gonna reach out and kind of try to trip it a little bit and see what happens. Um, there's a whole lot to to discuss in the topic of tithing, and we definitely don't have enough time in this uh, 45 minutes to really get a great grasp um, on the topic. And um, and it's one thing that it, it in preparing for this and that most all of this is basically coming from what Butch has prepared for me to say today. Uh, but I've also gone and, and done my own little study on it in, in this last week. Uh, not an extensive study by any means, but wanted to kind of refresh and, and uh, brush up on what the topic is all about. But um, there seems to be a lot of confusion out there. You know, there are, there are some there are some ideas out there about when you read the Old Testament and you start looking at tithing, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And so um, I, looking through this lesson um, and what, how it's being presented, the topic of tithing, I think this, is a, this does a really good job of kind of putting things in perspective for us, which is really, I think, what this, this topic and us discussing the topic of tithing should be about. It's not about finding the magic percentage. Uh, it's not about finding the magic number for us to give in order to be right with God every week, you know. Um, but as we've been talking throughout this whole quarter, it's about your heart. It's about what what you purpose in your heart to give. So um, he starts off in this lesson talking about uh, some statistics. He said, the more America has gained wealth, the less the church has addressed the subject of giving. And uh, I don't know, maybe that's true. I don't, there's, no, there's no citation in, in, here uh, from where that statement comes from. Um, but he, he's bringing up here the possibility that there's a correlation between us not addressing the subject of giving on a regular basis, and there seems to be a declining percentage of giving by Christians. So, in fact, statistics say that churchgoers have been steadily giving less uh, over the last 30 years. And there's some IRS data that shows that dollar for dollar, the average American gave more during the Great Depression than they do today. And so, again, I don't know exactly where that information came from, but I thought it was interesting. And um, um, so I went out and started to look for statistics. I, I, I like statistics. I like charts and graphs. Uh, I came up with, uh, I came to this website, the Barna Group. The Barna Group is... Um, We've got some information on what they're all about. Um, it's a visionary, re this is from their website. They're, they are a visionary research and resource company located in Ventura, California. They started in 1984. The firm is widely considered to be a leading research organization focused on the intersection of faith and culture. And uh, what I came up with is a study that they did called what motivates Christians to give? And um, uh, over the years, Barna Research has revealed a lot about Christian habits, uh, giving habits, motivations of U.S. adults, uh, particularly uh, churchgoers and Christians. So one of the uh, topics that they discuss in this article is for Christians, emotions tend to motivate our charity. Some of the main reasons when they pulled all of these individuals, they pulled Christians and non-Christians. Christians were defined as um, somebody who would say that their faith is very important to them, their belief in God is very important to them, and they have attended a church service within the last month. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of the kind of the spectrum there of, of who they are putting in this category of a Christian. And then they pulled non-Christians as well. 
One of the main, uh, it says that they believe people that gave, the main reasons that they got involved in a cause was primarily emotionally based. Um, they believed that uh, they could make a difference. Like 62% said that they give on a regular basis because they feel like they can make a difference. So that's an emotional thing. Or they saw or heard uh, a moving story. Anybody had a moving story kind of move them to take action? Um, more than a third of adults remembered giving, uh, being driven by an overwhelming sense of purpose. That was 38%. So there's all these different emotions that cause us to take action, that may cause us to give. The motivations for selecting a specific organization to support are also often made emotionally. Heart-centered, um, emotional things drive us to do these things. There might be a special interest that you are uh, interested in. A, there might be a personal interest that you are interested in. Um, you know, there's a lady that I know who recently, her husband was diagnosed with, uh, it's a, it, it amounts to kidney failure, basically. He needed a kidney transplant. And um, so, obviously, that motivated her to start up a collection for her, her husband to get this kidney transplant. And so, it was going to take money. Um, she started up this, this cause. And that became her number one priority, of course, right? And, and not only that, she felt like it should be everybody else's number one priority. So, she was reaching out to everybody saying, please help. You know, this is, here's the story. And, uh, and she saw this as because it was the most important thing and she was emotionally invested in this thing, she thought, not only should I drop what I'm doing and make this my number one goal is to raise this, this money, but I need to make it everybody else's number one goal as well. And so, and I think that's true that any one of us would, would do that. Just a few more statistics and then we'll jump into this lesson of tithing. Christians are most likely to give to where, would you say? Church, yeah, and uh, church and or uh, missions. A majority of practicing Christians, 91%, if you say you're a Christian, 91% say that they've given money to the church. Not a huge surprise. Many uh, donors likely assume other needs are, or causes are being addressed or at least financially supported through the church, and that's why they give through their tithings, their offerings, uh, trusting that their church uh, is going to be a facilitator for further giving and and uh, meeting the needs of others. For um, there's a bunch of different categories of where people give non-practicing Christians versus practicing Christians. Things like church missions, local organizations, um, medical aid, political groups, refugee settlements, all these different things that people tend to. Be charitable towards and give their money to on a regular basis or semi-regular basis, um, the church or practicing Christians outgive in every single one of those categories. So when you think about non-practicing Christians versus Christians, giving to a local church, and again, non-practicing Christian is somebody who hasn't gone to church in the last month, but says that their faith is important to them. 48% versus 91%. Missions, 29% versus 75%, and, and on, on down the line. So it says something about, you know, um, being a Christian, and there's a correlation, it seems, with the, the more, I, I guess, you're going to give more, I guess, if you are a Christian. I guess you could say that. Um, and there's probably many reasons for that. Of course, one of the reasons is we're commanded to give. So... Um, most Christians, th let me ask you this question, and this might be a question that Butch has asked in the class before. What would you consider to be the ultimate financial goal in your life? And this is where you all get to talk. What is the ultimate financial goal in life? To spend it all? <laughs> to spend it all? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, on what? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what do y'all think? And it gets a little personal, but that's okay. There's only a few of us in here, so we're family. What's the ultimate financial goal? To retire? Treasures in heaven. Okay. 
And so what does that look like in terms of, um, in terms of your money in this life? How's that related? Take care of uh, taking care of the needs of others. Okay. And who said uh, retire? Retire. Alex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Okay. It's good. All right. What else? Wendell. To retire requires some kind of financial fitness. So you can do both and be retired. Still adhering to the four times or ten percent or whatever the life entails in that. Okay. So Yep. Yep. All those things are still, they, they don't stop being important, right? All of these things that we do with our money, they don't stop being important. But w- what else? What's the, what's the ultimate financial goal in life? And it's different for everybody. Any other thoughts? So let me show you, or, or tell you, I should say, I don't have a chart to show you. Um, we're doing things old school, no PowerPoint today. But we have, uh, out of all of these different categories or answers that people gave, the ultimate financial goal for life, the number one thing that, uh, and, and, and this, this survey was broken up into categories, so think about who's here and who's not here and, and all that and where you kind of fall. Uh, one category is Christians, so you might put yourself into that category. Another, another uh, group is millennials, and I always have to look, if you're not sure if you're a millennial or not, you're probably not. Um, Brad, you probably are. If you're born between 1984 and 2002, you're a millennial. Uh, Gen X, born between 1965 and 1983. Boomers, between 46 and 64. And they've got a group called Elders, sorry. Uh, If you were born before 1945, you're an elder. So so those are the groups. And um, every one of those groups, except for one, placed providing for my family as the number one ultimate financial goal in life, providing for my family. Which, which group do you think did not put that one at the top? Say again? Millennials? Millennials? No? Shaking your head? Ed? Uh, I'm going to guess elders. Ooh, interesting. Why? Why do you think elders? Ah, yeah. Well, you're actually correct and not correct. <laughs> it's elders. Elders did not rank providing for my family as number one financial goal. What do you think it was? <laughs> What'd you say? They've already done that. They're done. Yeah, it's no longer my goal. And and Beth and I were talking about this last night. I asked her this question, and and she thought about it, and. Um, you know, your goals, of course, change as your life goes on. And so you might have already met some of these financial goals. Um, supporting the lifestyle that I want, meeting my obligations and needs, those were uh, the top, up in the top three. Being content, giving charitably. And number six, and this is where it ranked for Christians, number six is to serve God with my money. That being the ultimate financial goal in life. Serve God with my money. That was the number one thing that elders said that they, that was their financial goal, is to be able to serve God with their money. I thought that that was really interesting. Um, So there's this this correlation between age and generosity. Uh, It's funny about millennials. This says that they perceive, millennials perceive themselves to be generous, yet they give less than the other groups. Um, They ask the question, how generous am I with my money? And by generation, here's how it broke down. Um, well, I'm not going to go through all of this here, but I'll, I'll just, I think I highlighted one of these. It was, here we go. Even though millennials are most likely of the generations to report donating less than $50 last year, think about what you've donated, whether to church or, or an organization or just giving money to somebody who needed some help last year, $50 or less. Of those that said, I gave less than $50 last year, uh, three out of 10 of them 
would say that they are very generous and most likely of the generations to report three out of 10 rate themselves as very generous with their monetary giving. So there's this kind of skewed perspective um, in some of these, in some of these groups here, not, not picking on millennials, but um, they also, you know, uh, there's just some different things going on there. If you're starting out and you're just starting out with your family, you're probably likely to say that, you know, I need to take care of my family. And like we saw with uh, the elders group, I thought that was interesting that, that, that focus shifts over time. Not for everybody, but these are all just statistics, but they're fun to look at sometime. So we're going to jump into, um, well, before we do that, last week, just to recap, Butch talked about how we need to keep Jesus's perspective when we think about our money. He mentioned that it's not wrong to store up treasures, um, but we need to make sure we're storing up the right treasures, right? And um, he mentioned how we uh, rationalize just sometimes, just like this study showed. We want we want to provide for our family, and that's that becomes our number one financial goal. Um, you know, but we also need to make sure that we are having it as part of our goals with our finances is to serve God with our money, um, like the elders category. That should be our that should probably be our number one financial goal. Uh, Butch stated that we needed we need to be deliberate about how we invest, how we live our lives, and uh, one of the ways in which the Jews um, had to do that was, uh, they had to think deliberately, was, was about the tithe. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get started, though, um, let's uh, go ahead and have a prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for all of the blessings that you give us every single day and for the opportunity to take a look at this topic called tithing and understand uh, that it's more than just a, a, a number. It's more than just a percentage it's, uh, it talks about our, our obligations to you. It talks about uh, ownership, what's yours and what's not, not uh, what's, what's yours, what's not ours, and, uh, and putting things into perspective and in, in, uh, looking at that in contrast to uh, our giving and uh, our heart and, and those types of things. Father, I pray that you would please help us get through this topic and, uh, and, and speak the truth here. Um, and, and see what it has to say to us. And uh, like everything else in your word, we study it so that we can be changed by it. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for dying for our sins. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's, let's get into it. What is, what is tithing? You guys all know the answer to this question. We probably don't even need to talk about tithing because you all know what it is. What's tithing? Give money, Give money to the church, okay? What else? It's an old tradition. Okay. What else? A commanded percentage. Okay. What do you understand that percentage to be? Ten percent. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it means a tenth. Leviticus twenty seven uh, thirty, and I and I heard some great answers out there that. Uh, um, a lot of them were in this one verse here, Leviticus 27, 30. And, and I don't have, again, a PowerPoint for you. So I would invite you to open up your Bibles. We're going to flip around and we're going to look at a lot of scriptures, as many as we can, so that we can understand the topic. Um, it says, thus all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. So the tithe belongs to the Lord, not to the people. So we're establishing right up front that when we talk about this, this word tithe, we are talking about something that belongs to the Lord. Keep that in mind. And it's applied to everything, not just some things. It was holy to be set apart and given to God. Uh, as you stated, the meaning of the word tithe is a tenth part. So whatever it is you're talking about, whether it's money or your cattle or whatever, it's a tenth part. And, and today... You hear people use this term erroneously in place of all giving. Um, someone might say that they, they tithe $100 per week when they actually earn $2,500 per week. $100 is not a tenth of $2,500, right? Their terminology is not accurate. So when we talk about tithing, we need to make sure we're understanding what that means. Mm -hmm. Correct. 
Right. You're absolutely right that there's a difference between um, a tithe and something that we are giving from the heart. Okay. A, t- a tithe, what we're pointing out here in terms of the definition of the word tithe, it means a tenth. So if you are choosing to give something other than a tenth, you're not giving a tithe. You're not giving 10%, okay? But you're right. Whatever it is that we are giving, and we are, we're going to get into this more, the, di- the kind of the difference between, and this is, this is where I think we, we are all going to be challenged, is um, we're going to look at tithing and we're going to look at giving, and they really are two separate things. Wendell? Right. We change the meaning. Correct. We have a miracle. You know, my doctor, he said I broke an arm, I put it in a cast. It wasn't a miracle, it was his skills that he put in my arm that mm-hmm. helped heal. Right. Yeah. right. So that, sometimes you get those thoughts. It's like, is, yeah. it, is it hyperbole praise or are you just going to praise God and say that, you know, tithe your <coughs> Right. Yep, Wendell's pointing out that sometimes with some of these terms like tithing or miracles or what have you, that sometimes we take the word and we change its meaning as far as what we understand it to be. And uh, that, that's exactly right. That, and as we're going to see here, there's, there's a difference between tithing and giving. We'll get into, it, in, into that uh, more. But the term tithe means 10%. So if you're giving 2% or 4% or 6% or whatever that number is that you've purposed in your heart to give... That's, it's just, we're just pointing out that, that that's not what a tithe is. A tithe, a tithe is 10%. The, the Israelites were warned that to present to God anything less than a full 10% was to rob God. That comes from Malachi 3, uh, 8 through 10, which Richard uh, talked about this in his class last quarter. I think it was last quarter. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out blessing until it overflows. I think we like to focus on that last part of that verse. Test me in this, right? Uh, If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour blessings out, overflowing, right? We, We like the idea of receiving all those blessings. But sometimes we have a hard time holding on to, uh, holding or letting go of, I should say, uh, some of those blessings and giving back to God what he has commanded to give, which in the case of the Israelites was that 10%. They were commanded to give. It wasn't theirs. For every, think about it like this, for every, uh, um, for every dollar that you give to your kids, maybe it's an allowance or something like that, uh, I give ten dollars to one of my sons for an allowance, and uh, none of it was his to begin with. Right? It all came from me, and all I ask is that he takes one of those and he gives it back to me because it's mine anyway, right? And uh, but is he going to willingly, always willingly, give me that one dollar back? No, it takes t- it's, it's it's a hard thing. It takes time. But it's, if I said, all right, Adam, you are going to I'm going to make a rule. I'm going to I'm going to give you this, but you have to give me one. Every time I give you $10, you have to give me $1 back. That's not a, it's a, it's not negotiable. It is something that he is required to do. And by him not giving me that $1, when I come and ask for it, he is robbing me. This is the way that we are, we're supposed to be looking at this. God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, not just a part of it. Um, The obedient Israelite didn't ask whether he could give 7%. Can I do 7%? you know, or 5% this week. Nope, it was always 10%. John? Yep. Which points out, John's pointing out that in verse 8, you see tithes and offerings together. And uh, which points out that um, all of our giving, we need to look at it as 
if I've purposed in my heart to give this and I get to that point where it's time to give it and I hold on to it, what am I doing? I'm robbing God of that. If I'm holding back, and we see this um, over and over, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, where if we're holding back, it's, it's almost like we're saying, sorry, God, I don't trust you to take care of my needs. I need to hold on to a little bit for myself. And I've been there. I've done that. Um, so this is also pointing out that uh, he, he also said we, we don't get the opportunity to negotiate the percentage or the Israelites in this case. He also didn't ask whether um, the Israelite did not ask whether he could tithe on net rather than gross. Uh, whatever God provided, 10% belonged to him. And actually, there was not just one tithe. How many different tithes were there in the Old Testament? It's a pop quiz. I didn't realize this until I went back and read up on it. And there's lots of different schools of thought on this. And again, this is where it gets kind of muddy. Um, there's several different, there's at least, there's three different uh, tithes. One tithe supported the priests and Levites. So there was a tithe specifically for the priests and Levites. That's uh, found in Numbers 18, 21, and 24. I give to the Levites all the, the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. Instead, in verse 24, uh, I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. That is why I said concerning them, they will have no inheritance among the Israelites. So God is taking care of the priests, the, the Levites, uh, with specifically with the tithe, that 10%. So they don't have to work. They don't have to do anything. Other, well, it's a work. <laughs> They're working hard by disseminating the word of God to the people, right? I think it was a, a really awesome plan that God had that he was going to set apart a group of individuals who were going to be priests to lead the people, and he didn't want anything distracting them from being able to do that. So they didn't have to go out and find a job to support themselves. They were supported by the tithe. Another tithe provided for a sacred festival. That comes from Deuteronomy 12, 17 through 18. Uh, a third tithe supported widows and orphans and the poor. That comes from Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. And uh, chapter 26, verses 12 through 13. And the uh, I'll read some of that here. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns, so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Uh, the Levite and festival tithes were perpetual tithes. They just continued on and on. But the tithe for the poor was collected every third year is, is, is how this reads. Um, and if you add all that up, all those different tithes, and you kind of average it out, it comes out to about 23% per year. 23% of your income is God's in this, in this, in this uh, example here. Because Israel was a nation, as well as a community, when you think about Israel, you think about Israel, the nation, and a community, some people might argue that these funds, the tithe, equated to, like, taxes that we pay today. And I think that's a, a misunderstanding. Um, the first basic principle of the tithe was for religious purposes, uh, specifically supporting spiritual leaders, freeing them uh, to fulfill their job. The practice of tithing began long before the law of Moses. And you see that in Genesis chapter 14. I didn't realize this. I always thought tithing was laid out in the laws. Uh, but Abraham tithed to the high priest Melchizedek. He says, And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Jacob promised a tithe to the Lord. Genesis 28, verse 22 and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So uh, we're, not, we're not told in any other place um, others that tithed like that or even that these two tithed any other times. Um, Butch writes here that he read that uh, a historian said that Egyptians, Chaldeans, Assyrians, they all tithed to their gods and 
as did some ancient Chinese, Greeks, Romans, and Arabians. Every, all these different groups of people have tithed in their religions. The Israelite tithing was unique, though, because they were bringing the first fruits, and that's what we're going to get into next. So there's, there's the tithe, which is 10% that is, it belongs to God, and it's owned by God, and, we're, and we're, they were, the Israelites were commanded to give that. And then there's the idea of giving not just 10%, but the first fruits of what we are blessed with. John? Right. And that's the confusion. That's the that's the discussion. Right. That's the topic that people go back and forth on that. I'm not going to try and solve in this class, but it's a very good question. And I would invite you all to go back and study that. But from what I read, it was uh, there were two schools of thought. One is that, no, these are not in addition to the 10 percent thing. But there were there is the school of thought that there are three different distinct tithings going on. The, the every third year thing. Uh, from what I read, was because you uh, God commanded them, and maybe we can just read this here. Uh, eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, blah blah blah. The third of the uh, law provides these festivals. You must not eat in your own towns. Tithe the grain. So there was the idea that when there was a uh, a grain offering, there was all your your livestock. There was you know oils and the first firstborn of your herds and flocks, or whatever you vowed to give. And when you talk about crops, there are crops that, that you can plant that don't come into harvest within one year's period. It, it can take more than a year. Uh, there's different types of things that farmers might plant that are going to take, you know, maybe it takes two months to harvest. Maybe it takes six months. Maybe it takes 18 months. And God put down this, the idea is that he said, um, you can go ahead and plant for two years and then on that third year, I don't want you to work. I don't want you to plant. I don't want you to do anything. You're just going to reap that harvest and bring that. And I, I'm probably butchering this. But the idea is that you would have, for a year's time, you're, 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 you're storing that up and you're living off of that. And then you're giving 10% from that to God. And then you're living off the rest of it. So it has to do with harvest. It has to do with farming and all that stuff. Again, tough topic. But yeah. Right. 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 Um, yeah, no problem. Don't ask any more tough questions, though. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so we said that, let's see, first fruits. Okay, Proverbs 3 9. Uh, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Oh, here's, here's kind of where it is. Two to three times a year, the children of Israel were to bring an offering of first fruits to the Lord. And God said in Exodus 23:15, in the last sentence, uh, no one is to appear before me empty-handed. These first fruits included the first product of a vineyard, uh, the first annual product of grain, wine, olive, and sheared wool from Exodus. In Deuteronomy 18:4, you are to give them the first fruits of your grain, new wine, and olive, and olive oil and the first wool from the shearing of your sheep. The first of any meal, the first of any coarse meal, Numbers 15, 20 through 21, present a loaf from the first of your ground meal and present it as an offering from the threshing floor. Throughout the generations to come, you are to give this offering to the Lord from the first of your uh, ground meal. So we learn by all this that tithe talks about the amount, 10%. Um, and first fruits talks about the nature. So giving you the very first of what you blessed me with. And the same principle applied to their money. The tithe was recognized as God's. Because of this, the people did not give, at, uh, they did not give a tithe, but repaid it to the owner. So that's an interesting way to look at tithing. They are not giving it to the Lord. They are repaying it to the owner of all things. 
The Old Testament speaks of bringing the tithe. It talks about taking the tithe, presenting the tithe, or even paying the tithe. Tithes or first fruits um, is something that you, you are giving back to God. It's not something that you are offering or giving in, in, the ter- in the sense of the term that we use today, giving. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, these payments were no more optional than paying taxes today. So we said that people look at it like paying taxes. It's, it's not paying taxes because it's a religious thing. It's going tithing in the Old Testament. It's talking about giving to 10% to take care of the, the, the Levites and the priests. Um, but in the same way that you can't get around paying taxes, for the Israelites, these payments were not an option. You could even say that an Israelite paid tithes and first fruits out of obedience, whether they wanted to or not. But the Old Testament also emphasizes free will offerings. Okay, so Katie, this is back to you. Free will offerings. This is where it gets different than tithing. Leviticus 22, 18 through 23. Um, I hope you're jotting all these down. Numbers 15, 3, Deuteronomy 12, 6, and 17. Um, in Exodus 35, 29, it says, All the Israelite men and women who were willing, who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord, through Moses, had commanded them to do. These were voluntary contributions beyond the tithing or the first fruits. So this goes over and above tithing. Yes. Whoop. That was... Exodus 35, 29. Okay. And so we might say that these were, these were true giving since the tithe was more of a debt paid to God, not necessarily a gift per se. If we think of Old Testament giving as dreary or, you know, dutiful, then we could be wrong in, in the way that we look at giving. In fact, the Bible records that the Israelites got caught up in the thrill of giving. What's the, ver- what's the, the story in the New Testament that, that we read about that we go, wow, that's so cool, where everybody had everything in common and everybody was selling property and giving to those. And we've talked about it several times in this, in this class, this, this quarter. You remember the story? Acts 2. Acts 2, where the church is really just starting to get going. God's blessing them. And there was, they wanted to make sure that nobody was without. So all that had property and, and land, they were selling things and they were giving so that nobody was left behind. You see a similar um, passage, and I didn't realize this, and this is where we get into free will giving, kind of like in Acts 2. If we look at Exodus 36, 4 through 7, Exodus 36, 4 through 7, it says, And all the skillful men who were performing all the work of the sanctuary, sanctuary came, each from the work which he was performing. And they said to Moses, the people are bringing much more than enough for the construction work which the Lord commanded us to perform. So Moses issued a command, and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp, saying, let no man or woman any longer perform work with the contributions of the sanctuary. Thus the people were restrained from bringing any more, for the material that they had was sufficient and more than enough for all the work to perform it. When have we ever, in our congregation, said, stop giving? We're good. You, you don't need to come and work anymore on the building. You don't have to you know, bring your offerings anymore to, to set things up here where we're trying to go. It, we've got way too much resources now. You can stop giving. The emphasis here isn't, it's not on the amount, though, or the cause, but the willingness of each person's heart. Here, it wasn't the tithing, but this was giving over and, and above tithing. Wendell? Well, to me, that, you know, you mentioned they, the latter part of that verse, that the people continue to bring the gifts each morning because they wanted to. Yeah. They didn't just wanted because they had to. Yeah. Um, it seems they need to free will offering. Yep. We should have started with verse 3. I don't know why. Butch, yeah. didn't, Butch didn't have me start in verse 3. I don't know why. <laughs> but it, I thought that was a neat yeah. way. Can you read that one more time, Wendell? Verse 3. Uh, well, according to verse 3, they received from Moses everything the people of Israel had brought as gifts to build the holy temple. The people 
They, yeah. they continue to bring gifts each morning because they wanted to. John? Right. Yep, you're absolutely right. That was here too. First Chronicles 29, the story in verses 6 through 9. And then down in 14, um, like you pointed out, uh, this is David who's saying to the Lord, but who am I that, and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you, and from, from your hand we have given you. From your hand we have given you. Right? It's not from us. Brett. Wait a minute, where are you going to get your car wash? It's $5. <laughs> I, I need to know. <laughs> I think you're exactly right, Brad, that maybe one of the reasons why we are not given a certain target, a per certain percentage of a specific number to hit in the New Testament as far as our giving goes, is to leave it open-ended, as you put it, so that God could measure where we're at in our hearts with our giving. I like that. Wendell? Right. And, and we say it uh, we say it a lot to kind of justify that, you know, when, when we struggle with how much should I give, I hear this a lot. Well, God doesn't need my money. You know, God doesn't need your money. And, and you know, OK, God, the uh, supplier of all that there is. You're right. He does not need your cash. Um, but just like the principles that we have in the Old Testament that give that tell us that there is something to be said for setting aside a specific, you know, goal to take care of those and the church that to continue that on. In a way, God needs your money. <laughs> God, if if you were not giving, if you were not coming here and giving to the church, how would we all be sitting here today under this roof? How would the lights be on? How would we be able to contribute to missions? How would we be able to contribute to all these things that we care about? We would have to go somewhere else to do all of that, right? Which you can do. But um, it is a measure of our heart. And, and, and I'll just say to wrap up, we didn't get through all of it, but the main point is we can look at the Old Testament and we can look at tithing as a certain percentage and we can understand that you can go with that as a starting point if you want, that, but that, that was God's, right? So don't think that by looking at tithing as I'm meeting my obligations to God, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You might be doing it for the wrong reason when you think that that is your giving. Your giving should be a free will offering, and I'm talking to me, and, it, and, it, and maybe, it, maybe it needs to go over and above what's already God's. So that's the challenge for us is to take a look at how we're giving, grow in this area, and like Butch said, let's be purposeful 
and uh, deliberate in, in when we think about it. Thank you. Have a good day.